So hi everyone, thank you for being here today. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for accepting my presentation. It is a complete honor to be here today with all of you. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm going to present a, kind of my personal theoretical approach to uh, historical ecology and human ecodynamics. Um, why that's important for studying climate and what can we do to contribute to current to the current climate crisis that we are facing. So first, a theoretical introduction. What is uh, historical ecology and human ecodynamics? Well, uh, basically, uh, you can you can use both terms to to refer to the same thing, um, because uh, if you go to the definitions, human ecodynamics is basically the historical and long term study of the interrelationships that happen between humans and non humans uh, uh, through both space and time. Um, in this way, we have also to assess the agency that both these entities have on each other. So in other words, it is the, is the study of the uh, human natural systems. Uh, important for human ecodynamics is the disciplinary intertwine that it, it brings with it, because uh, you, you can use many different disciplines from different fields, such as uh, uh, a, ecological history, uh, landscape and environmental archaeology, uh, computational sciences, uh, geology, or ecology, among others. Um, as for historical ecology, it was firstly coined in 1994 by Carol Crowley, um, and it's basically more or less the same thing. It's trying to trace the interrelationships that happen between humans and non-humans through also both space and time, and trying to uh, analyze the different power relationships that happen um, between these interrelationships. Um, and we also use uh, a multiscalar uh, approach, so to analyze the agency of entities. Um, for both uh, human ecodynamics and historical ecology, the focus is always place on the landscape, because we understand landscapes as the main arena where uh, these interrelationships happen. Uh, the most important, probably the most important concepts of, uh, of historical ecology are Carol Cranley concept of heterarchy that I will explain later, uh, William Marquardt's dialectical framework, which is kind of if approach that is multiscalar, so that you don't put too much agency on some uh, entities or agents only, uh, uh, but rather that you try to analyze the different compounding uh, interrelationships between agents. Um, this is kind of a very dialectical interrelationship, basically. And also important is the concept of long longitudinal research and that of DONOP, which stands for Distribute Observe Networks of the Past, which tries to convey a, an idea that we have to analyze multiple sides in order to really understand the dynamics that happened in the past in order to contribute to the present. The most important features of human ecodynamics are probably, as you have seen before, that we place uh, agency to both humans and non-humans, and I argue that this is kind of very similar approach to that of Latourian act on network theory. And in reality, this allows us to analyze the synergies between different entities, irrespectively of their human or non-human uh, features. Uh, we also use a, an approach based on non-linearity, and in this way we try to break up with simplistic cause-effects models. Um, for that, we also use different hierarchical spatial and temporal scales, although as I will argue later, I think it is most useful to use uh, heterarchical rather than hierarchical approaches. Um, uh, human ecodynamics make us closer to the concept of entropy that is so often used in sciences. And it's also important for in terms of epistemology because it makes the case uh, for of working in a big data framework by using many different data, um, uh, multivariate data from different fields. 
Here you can see a part of a, a test by James McLeod, who was the first in coining the concept of human ecodynamics for archaeology. I, I, I won't read through the whole test, but just want you to focus on the main, uh, uh, main features of this paragraph. So the most important thing is that the energy and matter exchange, uh, the feedbacks of the environment, and the the renewal of higher entropy for the system to continue to be and develop and also the that he's always talking about the couple sets of biotic interactions and abiotic factors and perhaps more important for archaeology is that we can analyze human actions within these couple sets of human environment interactions my own personal approach also uses and utilizes uh, um, ideas from other philosophers, such as Mary Bookings' notion of nature not, not as something to be dominated or that is just useful, but rather as a way of, in an ontological sense, understanding what we are, um, with we, I'm referring both to humans and non-humans. Um, for Mary Bookings, uh, he uses an uh, idealectical approach in which non-humans have a first nature, and in which uh, humans has, have a first and a second nature in order to kind of say with this second nature culture. I think that is a very interesting way of approaching the nature culture divide, because with this, we, we, kind of, we, we, we can convey the idea that we are equal, but at the same time different and it is a way of nuancing the divide between nature and culture. I also find of special importance Rosie Gray Duty concept of post-human convergence in that we are breaking away from the divide between humans and non-humans and instead we are turning into an understanding that we are all, all interconnected or entangled. Um, I also find very important the, the concept of chiropractic uh, concept of heterarchy, which is in opposition to hierarchy, not a very rigid structure, but rather a fluid kind of ranking between the interrelationships uh, that happens between different agents, so that it is not all agents are equally important all the time, but depends on the moment and on the place. Um, I also apply uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, concept of intersubjectivity in order to differentiate my approach from those who use a flat ontological approach. In reality, with all these, what I try and what we try is to create a synthetic research of humans and non-humans. Because that is what historical ecology is about. It's about understanding and tracing the human, the historical human ecodynamics. It is a way of creating and developing an integrated history of humans and nature as a couple system, in which it is especially, especially important the concept of coevolution. Now, in order to apply and um, put all this theory to the ground, I'm just uh, going to show you a couple of uh, brief samples. So the first one, uh, I have argued elsewhere that we can understand Icelandic architecture, for example, to houses, not as something that is just human, but rather as the continual long-term and hierarchical entanglement of humans and non-humans. And I think that we can also apply, apply these to bigger frames and scales, such as understanding the landscape as these construction of different agents through time. Um, perhaps the, the most important uh, example of the, I, that I bring today is that of the entire project, which was an NSF-funded project that ended last year. Um, with this project, uh, the whole team tries uh, tr tried to create a, a computational ontology that represented the human ecodynamics of the North Atlantic. Um, the main feature, as I said, was a developing a computational ontology that represent these interrelationships between different agents. 
Uh, for that, we use uh, data gathered from over 25 years of research carried out by NEBU, which is the North Atlantic Biocultural Organization. And as you can see, it was a humongous project that made use of a lot of different data from across the North Atlantic. I think that it is important to reflect on the on on the on some concepts that we develop uh, through these different entanglements of agents uh, in the data project. So as you can see here, these are different concepts uh, such as climate or paleoclimate model or landscape. Uh, and it, it, it was, um, these concepts are not abstract, but rather what we express with this representation is that they are complex, um, entangled uh, concepts that are compounded of humans and non-humans agents. And I think that, that it is a, way, a good way of connecting with the next part of the presentation that I'm going to kind of present to provocative ideas. One is climate and the other is archaeology and climate. So to me, what is climate? Because I think that we sometimes have a misunderstanding about the word climate. Uh, it is not uncommon to see different studies in archaeology in which we present climate as something abstract or as something that is not really affected by humans, it is something that it is apart from humans. But we all know that climate and climate change is partly made of humans. And we are talking today about the different uh, anthropogenic driven climate change that we are facing. So that's that's problematic uh, to me, because I think that we should not consider climate as something that it is abstract, as something that it is not relatable to all, all us, but rather as a continual, continual and heterarchical entanglement of humans and non-humans. I think it is important to reflect on post-human theory to understand this, but a critical post-human theory that which also includes political explanations and social explanations. And I also think that it is important to understand that climate is not yet something that is happening in the future. It's something that is happening now and it happened before. So I, I find especially, especially useful the concept uh, developed by Pitek, Sargent and Lane of weathering climate, because we have to think about the specificities of every change in time compounding climate. I find quite, quite an interconnection with uh, Timothy Morton, uh, hyper object to define climate, but I think that it is more useful to withdraw from the idea of objects and instead searching for subjects, because I think that that's more productive in order to, to understand the complexities of what is climate. Um, I also find uh, useful the concept developed by um, the philosopher Alain Badou about events in order to understand and explain some very specific uh, changes in climate. Now, second, the second idea that I want to uh, think about what is the role of archaeology and climate? Uh, or should we just make, trying to make predictions about climate and climate change? Should we make predictions about that? Or are we more capable of developing evidence-based conceptualizations? Well, I think uh, start, uh, reading uh, philosopher and historian uh, Reinhard Koschelik that every history is post-eventum, and therefore our production, or knowledge, knowledge production, is basically following a positive rationale. And this is uh, unlike climate sciences, which I, an important part of climate sciences is basically focus on developing uh, predictive approaches in order to tackle climate change. Uh, but I think that it will be wrong just to say that we can make predictions uh, because 
we, we are capable of much more than that. We have access to a humongous archive, that of the many different data sets that we achieve when we excavate. Uh, and this is a way first of making evidence-based uh, conceptualizations of, about the interrelationships that happen between humans and non-humans, but also a way of understanding how people in the past cope with changing climate. And I think that we can apply these to our present. So, yes, uh, in order to conclude my presentation, what is the place of climate archaeology? Well, uh, more um, colleagues in 2015 uh, posited a, a series of difficulties that they found when trying to connect social sciences with climate sciences and not just the differences in that we are as social scientists making more contextualized approaches than those of uh, uh, made by climate sciences. Uh, they found at least four difficulties in connecting uh, social sciences and climate sciences. The first one is the differences in temporal and spatial scales, because normally climate sciences work with hundreds to millennia time scales, and they normally analyze whole continents or the whole planet, whereas uh, social sciences are more focused or oriented towards uh, decades to hundreds of years of analysis, and they are way more regional space focus. The second problem that they found is the differences in isolating climate effects from other effects, so that normally climate sciences are completely oriented towards understanding problems that arise from climate change. Um, they forget about different issues that are interconnected with climate change, but that are not really that related to, that are not directly related to climate change. And these changes are also important because they could add up to the problems caused by climate. And this makes a, another problem that is a difference, a different attitude towards prediction. Normally, uh, climate sciences are more preoccupied with quantitative and um, economic uh, problems or issues that happen um, starting from climate change versus our so, or social approach, which is way more contextualized and oriented towards people. And this makes a failure of communication. What is for the general public climate? Yes, statistics? I don't think so, and it is not. So they found a fruitful inquiry in uh, tra tracing the, the, the impact al al uh, and adaptations of climate change in socioeconomic systems, because it, is, uh, it can create an integrated and cross-disciplinary cross analysis. Okay, so what's the point in this? Well, I think that archaeology is an important year to connect these two divide, uh, two divides. So the first, the first thing that we have to think about is that most of the challenges that I expressed uh, just before come from mismatches between social sciences and climate sciences, whose frameworks are unlike at least landscape archaeology oriented toward short chronologies. In landscape archaeology or in archaeology in general, we normally work with uh, long-term um, scales. But it is also important not to lose the contextualization of every specific specificity, specificity of, of what we study. Because at the end of the day, what may climate, what may change is the compounding of different moments. Uh, and I think that working with long-term chronologies is a way of connecting social sciences with climate sciences in a way that it is impossible for other social sciences. We are also not uh, uh, site focused, but rather we tend to analyze landscapes and even earth systems. 
And this is a midpoint between what social sciences and climate sciences normally do. Also, we as archaeologists can offer multivariate data, and in this way we can contribute to both discussions about sociopolitical and economic explanations and about uh, such as inequality, and also about the environmental processes that we can trace through environmental data or archaeological data. And all these ways, archaeology might unite the divide between social sciences and climate sciences. So, what is the place of climate archaeology? Well, I think that climate archaeology is just in more can be encompassed within historical ecology, because that is what it is, it is about. It is, it, if you remember, it is about making or developing an integrated history. Indeed, different approaches in our field have, have been calling for harnessing different technological and cross-disciplinary approaches in order to understand climate um, and the entangled human ecosystem dynamics. Like social sciences, archaeology is preoccupied with social explanations, and I think that we cannot forget uh, to include in all our production narratives about political and socioeconomic changes and dynamics. We cannot be deluded by just you know, technology-driven approaches, but we have to include also sociopolitical explanations. Um, and, we, and we can do so in, at the same time that we are preoccupied with climate and with how climate affected different communities in the past. Because it is important to remember, climate is not a statistical object. It is made of different agents, both humans and non-humans. And it happened in the past, it's happening now, and it will happen. So, unlike uh, other climate sciences and um, social sciences that are more preoccupied with analyzing present climate change in order to yield future productions and the way that we can countermeasure this climate change, we should not be so preoccupied about making these well, these predictive approaches as much as about making conceptualizations about the past and also understanding how people in the past cope with climate change and how different entanglements between humans and non-humans made different successful and also not so successful stories. So using the parallel here of Janus or also Odin's Raven, Hugin and Moonin that can be translated to be memory and history, we have to look to the past, but connect the past to the present for a better future. Thank you.